<laughs> Dream about the bonfire intermission. <laughs> anyway, we're delighted you all are here this evening. The show tonight is in two acts, one intermission. The bathrooms are located up at the top of the hill, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. sugar the deeds were done and done again as my life is done in watermelon sugar I'll tell you about it because I am here and you are distant wherever you are we must do the best we can it is so far to travel and we have nothing here to travel except watermelon sugar I hope this works out I live in a shack near I death I can see eye death out the window. It is beautiful. I can also see it with my eyes closed and touch it. Right now it is cold and turns like something in the hand of a child. I do not know what that thing could be. There is a delicate balance in eye death. It suits us. The shack is small but pleasing and comfortable as my life, and made from pine, watermelon sugar, and stones, as just about everything here is. Our lives we have carefully constructed from watermelon sugar, and then traveled to the length of our dreams, along roads lined with pines and stones. I have a bed, a chair, a table, and a large chest that I keep my things in. I have a lantern that burns watermelon trout oil at night. That is something else. I'll tell you about it later. I have a gentle life. I go to the window and look out again. The sun is shining at the long edge of a cloud. It is Tuesday and the sun is golden. I can see piney woods and the rivers that flow through those piney woods. The rivers are cold and clear and there are trout in the rivers. Some of the rivers are only a few inches wide. I know a river that is only half an inch wide. I know because I measured it and sat beside it for a whole day. It started raining in the middle of the afternoon. We call everything a river here. We're that kind of people. I can see fields of watermelons and the rivers that flow through them. There are many bridges in the piney woods and in the fields of watermelons. There is a bridge in front of this shack. Some of the bridges are made of wood, old, and stained silver like rain. And some of the bridges are made of stone, gathered from a great distance, and built in the order of that distance. And some of the bridges are made of watermelon sugar. I like those bridges best. We make a great many things here out of watermelon sugar, including this book, and I'll tell you about it. All this will be gone into, traveled in watermelon sugar. This morning there was a knock at the door. I could tell who it was by the way they knocked, and I heard them coming across the bridge. They stepped on the only board that makes any noise. They always step on it. I've never been able to figure this out. I've thought a great deal about why they always step on that same board, how they cannot miss it, and now they stood outside my door knocking. I did not acknowledge their knocking because I just wasn't interested. I did not want to see them. I knew what they would be about and did not care for it. Finally, they stopped knocking and went back across the bridge, and they, of course, stepped on the same board. A long board with the nails not lined up right, built years ago and no way to fix it. And then they were gone, and the board was silent. 
I can walk across the bridge hundreds of times without stepping on that board, but Margaret always steps on it. I guess you're kind of curious as to who I am, but I'm one of those who do not have a regular name. My name depends on you. Just, just call me whatever is in your mind. If you're thinking about something that happened a long time ago, somebody asked you a question and you didn't know the answer, that's my name. Or perhaps it was raining very hard, that is my name. Or maybe somebody wanted you to do something and you did it, and then they told you what you did was wrong. Sorry for the mistake. And then you had to do something else. That is my name. Or maybe it was a game you played when you were a child. Or something that came idly into your mind when you were old and sitting in a chair near the window. That is my name. Perhaps you walked someplace and there were flowers all around. Oh, that is my name. Perhaps you stared into a river there was someone near you who loved you. They were about to touch you. You could feel this before it happened. And then, it happened. That is my name. And you heard someone calling as if from a great distance. Their voice was almost an echo. That is my name, or maybe you were lying in bed, almost ready to go to sleep, and you laughed at something, a joke unto yourself. A good way to end the day, that is my name. Perhaps you were eating something very good, and for a second forgot what you were eating, but still went on knowing it was good. That is my name. Perhaps the fire tolled like a bell inside the stove around midnight. That is my name. Or you felt bad when she said that thing to you. She could have told it to someone else, somebody who was more familiar with her problems. That is my name. Perhaps the trout swam in the rivers and the rivers were only eight inches wide. And the moon shone over eye death and the watermelon fields low, out of proportion, dark, and the moon seemed to rise from every living plant. That is my name. And I wish Margaret would leave me alone. What's wrong? What have I done? You've done nothing. Then why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. Yes, you are mad at me. No, I'm not. A little while after Margaret left, Fred came by. He was not involved with the bridge. He only used it to get to my shack. He had nothing else to do with the bridge. He only walked across it to get to my place. He just opened the door and came in. Hi, what's up? Oh, nothing much. Just working away here. I just came from the watermelon works. I want you to go over there tomorrow with me. There's something I want to show you about the plank press. All right. Good. Well, I'll see you tonight at dinner down at Ideth. Oh, I hear Pauline's cooking dinner tonight. That means we'll have something good. You know, I'm tired of Al's cooking. <laughs> the vegetables are always overdone. I'm tired of carrots, too. Oh, boy, if I eat another carrot this week, I'll scream. Yeah, Pauline's a good cook. Oh, yeah. What's that in your pocket, Fred? I found it coming through the woods from the watermelon orchard. I don't know what it is myself. I've never seen anything like it before. What do you think it is? Well, how do you hold it? I don't know. I don't know anything about it. It looks like one of those things that Inn Boyle and his gang used to dig up down at the Forgotten Works. So I've never seen anything like it. I'll show it to Charlie. Maybe Charlie will know. He knows about everything there is. Yeah, Charlie knows a lot. Well, I guess I'll be going now. Um, I'll see you tonight at dinner. Okay. Fred went out the door. He crossed the bridge without stepping on that board. Margaret always steps on and couldn't miss if the bridge were seven miles wide. After Fred left, it felt good to get back to writing again. To dip my pen in watermelon seed ink and write upon these sheets of sweet-smelling wood made by Al down at the shingle factory. Here is a list of the things that I will tell you about in this book. 
There's no use saving it until later. I might as well tell you now where you're at. Number one, I death. A good place. Number two, Charlie, my friend. Number three, the tigers and how they lived and how beautiful they were and how they died and how they talked to me while they ate my parents and how I talked back to them and how they stopped eating my parents, though it did not help my parents any. Nothing could help them by then. And we talked for a long time. And one of the tigers helped me with my arithmetic. And then they told me to go away while they finished eating my parents. So I went away. Later that night, I returned and burned the shack down. That's what we did in those days. <laughs> Number four, the statue of mirrors. Number five, old Chuck. Number six, the long walks I take at night. Sometimes I can stand for hours in a single place without hardly moving. Why, I've had the wind stop in my hand. Number seven, the watermelon works. Number eight, Fred, my buddy. Number nine, Al. <laughs> Number 10, the beautiful trout hatchery at Ideck. And how it was built and the things that happened there. It's a swell place for dancing. Number 11, the sun and how it changes. Very interesting. Hmm. Number 12, in Boyle and that gang of his. And all the terrible things they did and what happened to them. And how quiet and nice things are around here now that they're dead. <laughs> Number 13, conversations and things that happen around here day to day. You know, work baths, breakfast, dinner, that kind of thing. Number 14, Margaret. Number 15, all of our statues and the places where we bury our dead so that they glow at night and light is forever coming out of their tombs. Number 16, my life lived in watermelon sugar. There must be worse lives. Number 17, Pauline. She's my favorite, we'll see. Number 18, and this, the 24th book written in the last 171 years. Last month, Charlie said to me, You don't seem to like making statues or doing anything else. Why don't you write a book? <laughs> well, the last one was written 35 years ago. It's about time somebody wrote another book. <laughs> yeah, I remember it was written 35 years ago, but I can't remember what it was about. There used to be a copy of it at the sawmill. Did you know who wrote it? No. Nobody was like you. He didn't have a regular name. <laughs> now it was about owls. Yeah, and, it, and then it was a book about pine needles. <laughs> Very boring. And, and then there was one about the forgotten works, theories on uh, how it got started and where it came from. And with a guy who wrote the book, his name was Mike. He took a long trip into the forgotten works. He went in, oh, maybe a hundred miles and was gone for weeks. But he went beyond those high piles that we can see on clear days. He said there were piles beyond those that were even higher. Well, he wrote a book about his journey into the Forgotten Works. And it wasn't a bad book. It's a lot better than the books we find in the Forgotten Works. Those are terrible books. <laughs> well, uh, he said he was lost for days and came across things that were two miles long and green. <laughs> uh, well, he refused to furnish any other details about them. Even in his book just said they were two miles long and green. Well, that's his tomb down by that statue of a frog. Oh, yeah, I know that tomb well. He has blonde hair and he's wearing a pair of rust-colored overalls. Mm -hmm, yeah, well, that's him. <laughs> After I finished writing for the day, it was close to sundown, and dinner would be ready soon down at Idef. I looked forward to seeing Pauline, and eating what she would cook, and seeing her at dinner, and maybe I could see her after dinner. 
we might go for a long walk, maybe along the aqueduct. Then maybe we could go back to her shack for the night, or stay at Ideth, or come back up here. If Margaret wouldn't knock the door down the next time she came by, the sun was going down, going down over the piles and the forgotten works. They turned back far beyond memory and glowed in the sundown. I looked up through the pines and saw the evening star. It glowed a welcoming red from the sky, for that is the color of our stars here. They are always that color. I counted a second evening star on the opposite side of the sky, not as imposing, but just as beautiful as the one that arrived first. I came upon the real bridge and the abandoned bridge. They were side by side across a river. Trout were jumping in the river. A trout about 20 inches long jumped. I thought it was a rather nice fish. I knew I would remember it for a long time. And I saw somebody coming up the road. It was old Chuck coming up from my dad to light the lanterns on the real bridge and the abandoned bridge. He was walking slowly because he is a very old man. Some say that he is too old to light the bridges and that he should just stay down at I death and take it easy. But old Chuck likes to light the lanterns and come back in the morning and put them out. Hey, everybody's got to have something to do, and lighting these bridges is my thing to do. Well, let old Chuck light the bridges if he feels like it. Keeps him out of mischief. <laughs> <laughs> because old Chuck must be 90 years old if he's a day, and mischief has passed far beyond him, moving at the speed of decades. <laughs> Hello, Chuck. Yeah, good evening. I've come to light the bridges. How are you this evening? I've come to light the bridges. Beautiful evening, isn't it? Oh, yes, lovely. <laughs> Old Chuck went over to the abandoned bridge and lit the lantern on the Ideth side of the bridge. The abandoned bridge has been that way since the time of the tigers. In those days, two tigers were trapped on the bridge and killed, and then the bridge was set on fire. The fire only destroyed part of the bridge. The bodies of the tigers fell into the river. Well, you can still see their bones lying there on the bottom in the sandy places and lodged in the rocks and scattered here and there. Small bones and rib bones and a piece of a skull. <laughs> there is a lantern at each end of the bridge. Old Chuck lights the lanterns every evening, though some say he is too old. The lanterns are in the shape of faces. One face is that of a beautiful child, and the other face is that of a trout. Uh, the lanterns on the abandoned bridge are tigers. <laughs> I'll walk with you down to Ida. Oh, no, I'm too slow. Well, you'd be late for dinner. <laughs> well, what about you? <laughs> oh, I've already eaten. Pauline gave me something to eat just before I left. Oh, what are we having for dinner? Oh, no. Paulie told me if I met you on the road not to tell you what's for dinner tonight. <laughs> she made me promise. That Pauline. Well, she made me promise. <laughs> it was about dark when I arrived at Ideth. The two evening stars were now shining side by side. The smaller one had moved over to the big one. They were very close now, almost touching. And then they went together and became one very large star. I don't know if things like that are fair or not. <laughs> Just before I arrived at Ideth, it changed. Ideth's like that, always changing. It's for the best. I could hear the river above me, flowing out of the living room. The river sounded fine. Almost everybody was there, that is, those who take their meals at Ideth. Charlie and Fred were talking about something. Pauline was just getting ready to serve dinner. Everybody was sitting down. She was happy to see me. Hi, stranger. What's for dinner? Stew, the way you like it. Oh, great. She gave me a nice smile, and I sat down. Pauline was wearing a new dress, and I could see the pleasant outlines of her body. 
The dress had a low front, and I could see the delicate curve of her breasts. I was quite pleased by everything. The dress smelled sweet because it was made from watermelon sugar. Well, how's the book coming? <laughs> oh, fine, just fine. Yeah, well, I hope it's not about pine needles. <laughs> Pauline served me first. She gave me a great big helping of stew. Everybody was aware of me being served first and the size of the helping, and everybody smiled, for they knew what it meant, and they were happy for the thing that was going on. Most of them did not like Margaret anymore. Almost everybody thought that she had conspired with Inboil and that gang of his, though there had never been any real evidence. The stew really tastes good. Mm, good. It's uh, hot better than carrots. <laughs> sure is, Fred. <laughs> Don't laugh too hard, dearie. You know how Al is about his cooking. Just as long as it's not about pine needles. <laughs> After dinner, Fred said that he would do the dishes. Pauline said, oh no. But Fred insisted by actually starting to clear the table. He picked up some spoons and plates and that settled it. Charlie said that he would go in the living room and sit by the river and smoke a pipe. Al yawned. The other guys said that they would do other things and went off to do them. And then, old Chuck came in. Well, what took you so long? Oh, I decided to stop by the river and rest, and I fell asleep and, and had a long dream about the tigers. I dreamed they were back again. Sounds horrible. Oh, oh no, it, it was all right. This time they were different. Why, they played musical instruments and went for long walks in the moon. Well, they stopped by the river and played. Their instruments looked nice, and, and they sang songs, too. Well, you remember how beautiful their voices were? Oh, yes, they had beautiful voices, but I never heard them singing. Well, they were singing in my dreams. I can remember the music, but I can't remember the words. And they were good songs, too. There was nothing frightening about them. Perhaps I'm an old man. No, they had beautiful voices. Well, I liked their songs. And then I woke up and I could see the lanterns on the bridges. Their songs were like the lanterns burning oil. I was a little worried about you. Oh, no, I, I sat down in the grass and leaned up against a tree and fell asleep and had a long dream about the tigers and they sang songs but I can't remember the words and their instruments look nice. They look like the lanterns. <laughs> Old Chuck's voice slowed down. His body kept relaxing until it seemed as if he had always been in that chair, his arms <laughs> gently resting on watermelon sugar. Pauline and I went into the living room and sat down on a couch in the grove of trees by the big pile of rocks. There were lanterns all around us. I took her hand in mine. Her hand had a lot of strength gained through the process of gentleness, and that strength made my hand feel secure. But there was a certain excitement, too. She sat very close to me. I could feel the warmth of her body through her dress. In my mind, the warmth was the same color as her dress, a kind of golden. How's the book coming along? Fine. What's it about? I don't know. <laughs> well, is it a secret? No. Well, is it a romance like some of the books from the Forgotten Works? No, it's not like those books. I remember when I was a child, we used to burn those books. There were so many of them. They burned for a long time. There aren't that many now. No, it's just a book. All right, I'll get off you. But you can't blame a person for being curious. Nobody's written a book around here in so long. Certainly not in my lifetime. Hello there. Hi. Hi. Oh, thanks for doing the dishes. My pleasure. I'm sorry to bother you people, but I just thought I'd come by and remind you about meeting me up at the plank press tomorrow. Uh, there's something up there I want to show you. Okay, I haven't forgotten what's it about. Well, I'll show you tomorrow. Good. Well, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I know you people have a lot to talk about, so uh, I'll go now. That certainly was a fine dinner party. <laughs>
Do you still have that thing you showed me today, Fred? I'd like Pauline to see it. What thing? Oh, something Fred found down in the woods today. No, I don't have it. I left it in my shack, but I'll show it to you tomorrow at breakfast. What is it? You don't know yeah, what it is. It's a strange looking thing. It's like one of those things from the forgotten world. <coughs> oh. Well, anyway, I'll show it to you tomorrow at breakfast. Good. I look forward to seeing it, whatever it is. <laughs> Sounds pretty mysterious. Okay, then. Well, I, I guess I'll be going now. I just wanted to remind you about meeting me at the Franklin. <laughs> 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 well, don't feel that you have to rush off. Uh, join us here for a while. Sit down. Oh, no. No, no, thank you anyway. There, there's something I have to do up in my shack. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks again for doing the dishes. Huh? Oh, oh. <laughs> it was getting late now, and I went down to say goodnight to Charlie. We could barely see him sitting down on his couch near the statues that he likes and the place where he builds a small fire to warm himself on cold nights. We just came to say goodnight. Well, oh, hi. Yeah, goodnight. <laughs> Well, I mean, how are you people doing? Okay. Yeah, well, that was really a wonderful dinner. Uh, we're really fine. Uh, a good stew. Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, are you going to spend the night here at IDEP? No. I'm going to spend the night with Pauline. Oh. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. We stopped on the bridge across the river. There were pale green lanterns on the bridge. They were in the shape of human shadows. Pauline and I kissed. Her mouth was moist and cool, perhaps because of the night. I heard a trout jump in the river, a late jumper. The trout made a narrow door-like splash. There was a statue nearby. The statue was of a gigantic bean. That's right, a bean. Somebody a long time ago really loved vegetables. And there are 20 or 30 statues of vegetables scattered here and there in watermelon sugar. There's a statue of an artichoke near the shingle factory. And there's a 10 foot carrot near the trout hatchery at Ida. Oh. Then there's a head of lettuce near the school. And there's a bunch of onions near the entrance to the Forgotten Mark. And there are other vegetable statues near people's shacks and a rutabaga by the ballpark. Yeah, and a little ways from my shack, there's a statue of a potato. Well, I don't particularly care for it, but somebody a long time ago really loved vegetables. <laughs> well, I even asked Charlie if he knew who it was, but he had the slightest idea. Must have really liked vegetables, though. Yeah, there's a statue of a potato right near my shack. We passed by the watermelon works. It was silent and dark. Tomorrow morning it would be filled with light and activity. There were a dozen or so pale lights coming up from the bottom of the river. They were tombs. The tombs look nice tonight. They certainly do. <laughs> They're mostly children here, aren't they? Yes. They're really beautiful tombs. Moths fluttered above the light that came out of the river from the tombs below. There were five or six moths fluttering over each tomb. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, a big trout jumped out of the river above a tomb and got one of the moths. <laughs> the other moths scattered and then came back again, and the same trout jumped again and got another moth. He was a smart old trout. <laughs> the trout did not jump anymore and the moths fluttered peacefully above the light coming from the tombs. How's Margaret taking all this? I don't know. Is she hurt or mad or what? Do you know how she feels? Has she talked to you about it since you told her? She hasn't talked to me at all. I saw her yesterday near the watermelon works. I said hello, but she walked right past me without saying anything. She seemed terribly upset. I don't know how she feels. I thought she'd be at I did tonight, but she wasn't there. I don't know why I thought she'd be there. I just had a feeling that I was wrong. Have you seen her? No. 
I feel bad about this. Margaret and I were such good friends. All the years we've spent together at IDEF. We were like sisters. I'm sorry that things had to work out this way, but there wasn't anything we could do about it. The heart is something else. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. You're right. Here we are. Please come here. That feels good. Let's try some more. <laughs> that would be good. We went over and lay upon my bed. I took her dress off. She had nothing underneath. We did that for a while, and then I got up and took off my overalls and laid it back down beside her. We made a long and slow love. A wind came up, and the windows trembled slightly. The sugar set fragilely ajar by the wind. I liked Pauline's body, and she said that she liked mine, too. And we couldn't think of anything to say. The wind stopped suddenly, and Pauline said, After making love, we talked about the tigers. It was Pauline who started it. She was lying warmly beside me, and she wanted to talk about the tigers. Well, old Chuck's dream got me thinking about them. I wonder why they could speak our language. No one knows, but they could speak it. Charlie says maybe we were tigers a long time ago and changed, but they didn't. I don't know. It's an interesting idea, though. <laughs> I never heard their voices. I was just a child, and there were only a few tigers left, old ones, and they barely came out of the hills. They were too old to be dangerous, and they were hunted all the time. I was six years old, and they killed the last one. I remember the hunters bringing it to eye death. There were hundreds of people with them. The hunter said they had killed it up in the hills that day, and it was the last tiger. They brought the tiger to eye death, and everybody came with it. They covered it with wood, and they soaked the wood down with watermelon trout oil, gallons and gallons of it. I remember that the people threw flowers on the pile and, and stood around crying because it was the last tiger. Charlie took a match and lit the fire, and it burned with a great orange glow for hours and hours, and black smoke poured up into the air. It burned until there was nothing left but ashes. And then the men began right then and there to build a trout hatchery at Ida, right over the spot where the tiger had been burning. It's hard to think of that now when you're down there dancing. I guess you remember all this. You were there, too. You were, you were standing beside Charlie. Yeah, that's right. They had beautiful voices. I never heard them. Well, perhaps that was for the best. Maybe you're right. Time. She was soon fast asleep in my arms. Her sleep tried to become my arm and then my body, but I wouldn't let it because I was suddenly very restless. I got up and put on my overalls and went for one of the long walks I take at night. The night was cool and the stars were red. I walked down by the watermelon works. That's where we process the watermelons into sugar. We take the juice from the watermelons and cook it down until there's nothing left but sugar, and then we work it into the shape of this thing that we have, our lives. I sat down on a couch by the river. Pauline had gotten me thinking about the tigers. I sat there and thought about them, how they killed and ate my parents. <laughs> we lived together in a shack by the river. My father raised watermelons and my mother baked bread. 
I was going to school. I was nine years old and having trouble with arithmetic. One morning the tigers came in while we were eating breakfast and before my father could grab a weapon, they killed him and they killed my mother. My parents didn't even have time to say anything before they were dead. Don't be afraid. We're not going to hurt you. We don't hurt children. You just sit right there where you are and we'll uh, tell you a story. Uh, what kind of a story would you like to hear? I know a good story about a rabbit. I don't want to hear a story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those were my folks! Oh, we're terribly sorry. Really, we are. We wouldn't do this if we didn't have to. We weren't absolutely forced to. But this is the only way we can keep alive. We're just like you. We speak the same language as you do. We think the same thoughts. But we are tired. You could help me with my arithmetic. What's that? My arithmetic. <laughs> oh, your arithmetic. Yeah. Well, um, what would you like to know? What's nine times nine? Eighty-one. Oh, what's eight times eight? Fifty-six. I asked them a half a dozen other questions. Six times six, seven times four. I was having a lot of trouble with arithmetic. Finally, the tigers got bored with my questions and told me to go away. Go away. Okay. I'll go outside. Ah, but don't go too far. We don't want anyone to come up here and kill us. Okay. <laughs> I'm an orphan. <laughs> I could see a trout in the river. He swam directly at me and then he stopped. Right where the river ends and the land begins, he stared at me. What do you know about anything? After about an hour or so, <laughs> the tigers came outside and stretched and yawned. Nice day. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, uh, we're uh, terribly sorry about having to kill your parents and eat them. <laughs> but please, try to understand. We tigers are not evil. This is just a thing we have to do. <laughs> All right. Thanks for helping me with my arithmetic. <laughs> oh, think nothing of it. <laughs> uh. The tigers left. I went over to Idek and told Charlie that the tigers had eaten my parents. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> the tigers are so nice. Why do they have to go and do a thing like that? Well, they can't help themselves. <laughs> well, now, I like the tigers, too. Uh, I've had a lot of good conversations with them. Well, they're very nice and have a good way of stating things, but uh, yeah, we're going to have to get rid of them soon. Yeah, one of them helped me with my arithmetic. Oh, well, they can be very helpful, but well, they're dangerous. <laughs> well, what are you going to do now? I don't know. Well, uh, how would you like to stay here at Idep? Yeah, that sounds good. Well, it's fine, fine, that it's set. <laughs> that night, I went back to the shack and set fire to it. I didn't take anything with me, and I went to live at Idep. That was 20 years ago, though it seems like it was only yesterday. What's eight times eight? Finally, 
I stopped thinking about the tigers and started back to my shack. I would think about the tigers another day. There would be many. I wanted to stay the night with Pauline. I knew that she would be beautiful in her sleep, waiting for me to return. She was. <laughs> A crack of gray sun shone through the window and lay quietly on the floor. I went over and put my foot in it, and then my foot was gray. <laughs> I looked out the window and across the fields and piney woods and to the town, to the forgotten works. Everything was touched with gray. Cattle grazing in the fields and the roofs of the shacks and the big piles and the forgotten works all looked like dust. The very air itself was gray. We have an interesting thing with the sun here. It shines a different color every day. No one knows why this is, not even Charlie. We grow watermelons in different colors. Here's how we do it. Seeds gathered from gray watermelons, picked on a gray day, and then planted on a gray day, will make more gray watermelons. It's really very simple. The colors of the days and the watermelons go like this. Monday, red watermelon. Tuesday, golden watermelon. Wednesday, gray watermelon. <laughs> Thursday, black, soundless watermelon. Friday, white watermelons. Saturday, blue watermelons. And Sunday, brown watermelon. And today would be a day of gray watermelons. <laughs> <laughs> I like best tomorrow, the black, soundless watermelon days. When you cut them, they make no noise and taste very sweet. Hello. You're up. I wonder what time it is. Oh, it's about six. I have to make breakfast this morning at Ida. Come over here and give me a kiss and tell me what you'd like for breakfast. We walk back to eye death holding hands. Hands are very nice things, especially after they have traveled back from making love. I sat in the kitchen at eye death, watching Pauline make the batter for hot cakes, my favorite food. She put a lot of flour and eggs and good things into a great blue bowl and stirred the batter with a big wooden spoon almost too large for her hand. I wonder if Margaret will be here today. I'll be glad when we're talking again. Oh, don't worry, everything will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... It's just Margaret and I have been such good friends. I'd always liked you before, but I never thought we'd ever be anything good friends. You and Margaret were so close for years. I just hope that everything works out and Margaret finds someone new and will be my friend again. Don't worry, everything will be all right. Mmm, hot cake! Charlie must have eaten a dozen hot cakes himself. I've never seen him eat so many hot cakes. And Fred ate a few more than Charlie. It was quite a sight. There was a big platter of bacon and lots of fresh milk and a big pot of strong coffee. And there was a bowl of fresh strawberries, too. A girl came by from the town and left them off just before breakfast. She was a gentle girl. Oh, thank you. And what a lovely dress you have on today. Did you make it yourself? You must have, because it's so pretty. Thank you. I just wanted to bring some strawberries down to Ida for, for, for breakfast. So I woke up very early and gathered them down by the river. <laughs> They're such fine berries. You must know a good place to get them, and you must show me where that place is. It's right near the statue of the Rutabaga by the ballpark, just down from where that funny green bridge is. She was about 14 years old and very pleased that her strawberries were a big hit at high death. All of the strawberries were eaten at breakfast and again, as for the hotcakes. Mm, these are really wonderful hotcakes. <laughs> Would you like some more? Well, well, maybe another one if, uh, well, if there's any more batter. <laughs> there's plenty. How about you, Fred? <laughs> well, uh, maybe just one more. <laughs> 
after breakfast. I kissed Pauline while she was washing the dishes and put the thread down to the watermelon works to see something he wanted to show me about the plank press. We took a long, leisurely stroll down there through the morning of a gray sun. It looked like it might rain, but of course it would not. The first rain of the year would not start until the 12th day of October. As we neared the watermelon works, the air was full of the sweet smell of the sugar being boiled in the vats. There were great layers and strips and shapes of sugar hardening out in the sun. Red sugar, golden sugar, gray sugar, black, soundless sugar. White sugar, blue sugar, brown sugar. Well, that sugar sure looks good. Yeah. Hi, Al. Hello. Good morning. What brings you down here, Fred? Hi, oh, Al. Yeah. Uh, Fred just wants to show me something. What's that? Well, that's a private thing. Oh, what? Well, show away. Mm -hmm. uh, let's shut her off for a Fred turned off the switch and had me come over very close and get down on my hands and knees and crawl under the press until we came to a very dark place. And then he lit a match and showed me a bat hanging upside down from a housing. Under there a couple of days ago. What do you think about that? Yeah! Can that beat everything, huh? Yeah, it's got a head start. <laughs> After having admired Fred's bat and crawled out from underneath the plank press, I told him that I had to go up to my shack and do some work, plant some flowers and things. Are you, you going to eat dinner up at I did? Nah, I think I'll just have a snack downtown at the cafe later on. Uh, Care to join me, Fred? Sure, sure, you bet. Well? Okay. I think you're having frankfurters and sauerkraut today. No, that was yesterday. <laughs> well, you're right. Yeah. Today is uh, meatloaf. How does that sound? Oh, that sounds good. Mm. I'll see you for lunch then, about 12. Okay. Bye, Al. Bye. <laughs> I left Fred supervising the plank press with big golden planks of watermelon sugar coming down the chain. The watermelon works was bubbling and drying away, sweet and gentle in the warm gray sun. <laughs> On my way to the shack, I decided to go down to the river where they were putting in a new tune and look at the trout that always gather out of a great curiosity when the tombs are put in. That's how we bury our dead here. Of course, we used a lot less tombs when the tigers were in bloom. <laughs> But now we bury them all in glass coffins at the bottoms of rivers and put foxfire in their tombs so they glow at night and we can appreciate what comes next. I saw a trout that I've known for a long time watching the tomb being put in. It was the grand old trout raised as a fingerling in the trout hatchery at Ideth. I knew this because he had the little eye death bell fastened to his jaw. He is many years old and weighs many pounds and moves slowly with wisdom. The grand old trout usually spends all of its time upstream by the statue of mirrors. I'd spent many hours in the past watching this trout in the deep pool there. I guess he'd been curious about this particular tomb and had come down to watch it being put in. The grand old trout looked over at me. I believe he recognized me, for he stared at me for a couple of minutes, and then he turned back to watching the tomb being put in, the final inlay work being done. I stayed there for a little while by the river, and when I left to go to my shack, the grand old trout turned and stared at me. He was still staring at me when I was gone from sight, I thought. It was good to be back at my shack, but there was a note on the door from Margaret. I read the note and it did not please me and I threw it away so not even time could find it. I spent a half an hour or so pacing back and forth on the bridge, but I did not once find that board that Margaret always <laughs> steps on. That board she could not miss if all the bridges in the world were put together 
formed into one single bridge, she'd step on that board. <laughs> Suddenly, I felt very tired and decided to take a nap before lunch and went into the shack and lay down in my bed. I looked up at the ceiling, at the beams of watermelon sugar. I stared at the grain and was soon fast asleep. I had a couple of small dreams. One of them was about a moth. The moth was balanced on an apple. Then I had a long dream, which was again the history of Inboil and that gang of his, and the terrible things that happened just a, a few short months ago. <laughs> Inboil and that gang of his lived in a little bunch of lousy shacks with leaky rooms near the forgotten rocks. They lived there until they were dead. I think there were about 20 of them, all men like Inboil that were no good. First, it was just Inboil who lived there. He got in a big fight one night with Charlie and told him to go to hell and said he would sooner live by the forgotten works than in eye death. To hell with eye death! You know what's wrong with this place? No, what's wrong, Inboil? You, you seem to have all the answers these days. Well, tell us. Well, I will tell you. This place stinks. This isn't eye death at all. This is just a figment of your imagination. All you guys here are just a bunch of clucks doing clucky things, and you're clucking eye death! Eye death! Ha! Don't make me laugh! This place is nothing but a clap trap! Well, you wouldn't know eye death if it walked up and bit you! I know more about I death than all of you guys, especially Charlie here, who thinks he's something extra. I know more about I death than my little finger than all you put together. Do you have the slightest idea what's going on here? I know. I know. I know! The hell with your I death! I've forgotten more I death than you'll ever know. I'm going down to the forgotten works to live! You guys can have this damn rat hole! Don't feel bad, Charlie. He'll be sober tomorrow and everything will be different. He's, he's just drunk again and uh, tomorrow when he sobers up, he'll be better. No, I, uh, I think he's gone for good this time. I hope it works out for the best. Charlie was very sad, and we were sad too, because Inboil was Charlie's brother. how old the forgotten works are. Reaching as they do into distances we cannot travel nor want to. The forgotten works just go on and 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 on. You get the picture, it's a big place. <laughs> Much bigger than we are. There is a gate there, and beside the gate is the statue of a forgotten thing. Above the gate, there's a sign that says, This is the entrance to the forgotten works. Be careful, you might get lost.
Oh, hello. Down here again, huh? Well, good afternoon, M. Boyle. Well, same to you, pretty. Take no offense. <laughs> I'm just here to look at the forgotten works. Well, they're all yours. Anything you like? some real good interesting things today just before I went to have lunch. They're about a quarter of a mile in. I can show you the place. What he said was a quarter of a mile, but it seemed like miles. Weaving in and out, climbing <laughs> higher and higher into the piles. Dinner that night at Ideth was trouble. Everybody played with their food. Al had cooked up a mess of carrots. <laughs> they were good, mixed with honey and spices, but nobody cared. They were worried about the inboy and that gang of his. Pauline didn't touch her food. Neither did Charlie. Well, I don't know what's gonna happen. It looks serious, though. I, I've been afraid something like this is going to happen for a long time, ever since In Boyle got involved with the Forgotten Works and took to making that whiskey of his and getting men to go down there and live his kind of life. And I've been afraid something like this is going to happen for a long time. <laughs> Should do for a long time, and now it looks like it's here, or will be shortly. <laughs> Perhaps tomorrow, who knows? What are we going to do? What can we do? And just wait. That's about all. I mean, well, we can't threaten them or defend ourselves until they've done something. And who knows what they're going to do? They won't tell us. Well, I went down there myself yesterday morning to ask him, boy, what was up. <laughs> he said, we'd see soon enough. They'd show us what I did really was. None of the false stuff we have. Take care of anything that happens. Those drunken bums can't do anything. 
that we can't handle. You bet. <laughs> You're right. We can handle this. We live at Idaho. Then we heard the front doorbell ring. Old Chuck said he heard voices, but it was impossible to hear voices from that distance. I'll get the door. <coughs> it's in Boyle. He wants to see you, Charlie. He wants to see all of us. You people think you know about I guess You don't know anything about I guess. You don't know anything about I death. <laughs> Not a damn thing. You're all at a masquerade party. <laughs> we'll show you what I death is really all about. Yeah, well, what do you know that we don't know? Well, let us show you. Let us into the trout hatchery and we'll show you a thing or two. <laughs> 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 Are you afraid to find out about my death? <laughs> what it really means? What a mockery you made of it! Oh, you! And you, Charlie, more than the rest of these clowns! All right, all right, come then! Come then, show us my death! <laughs> 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 when are we gonna get to I death? Well, you are at I death. What's this? I death. <laughs> happening here with I-Death. Well, the tigers do more about I-Death than you know. But you killed all the tigers. Away, and you've been here like a bunch of clocks ever since. 
We're all gonna bring back our jet. We're all gonna bring back our jet. Yeah! yeah. My gang here and me. I've been thinking about it for years. And now I'm going to do something about it. I jet will be again. What are you gonna do with that knife? <laughs> well, I'll show you. This is I Jeff! Oh. And he took the knife and cut off his thumb and dropped it into a tray filled with trout just barely hatched. The blood started running down his hand and dripping on the floor. Oh, that's Oh, when do I cut off my thumb? <laughs> right now! Oh! Now, why have you done this? This is only the beginning. This is the true meaning of my death. Ah, you all look silly without your thumbs. That's the true all right, men, now let's cut off our noses. Oh. Help! I do!
have you been? <laughs> In the forgotten world. But well, don't you know what happened? No. What's wrong? <laughs> Where's Amboy? He's dead. And all his gang, too. Dad, you must be joking. They came up here an hour ago and they all killed themselves. They made a terrible scene. I don't believe you. What kind of joke is this? It's no joke. Is it true? Yes. Why? Why? No. I don't know. None of us do. They came up here a little while ago and killed themselves. It's a mystery to us. No. 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 They did it with jackknives. Her hand felt cold and awkward in my hand, as if the fingers were too small to fit. I could only stare at her, who had disappeared into the forgotten works that morning. Everything is reflected in a statue of mirrors. If you stand there long enough and empty your mind of everything else but the mirrors. And you must carefully not want anything from the mirrors. They just have to happen. An hour or so passed as my mind drained out. Some people cannot see anything in the statue of mirrors, not even themselves. Then I could see eye death and the town and the forgotten works and rivers and fields and the piney woods and the ballpark and the watermelon works. I saw old Chuck on the front porch of Ideth. He was scratching his head and Charlie was in the kitchen buttering himself a slice of toast. The shacks of Inboil and that gang of his lay now only his ashes by the gate to the forgotten works. A bird was looking near the ashes for something. The bird didn't find what it was looking for, got tired, and flew away. I saw Pauline walking through the piney woods, up toward my shack. She was carrying a painting with her. It was a surprise for me. <laughs> I saw Fred in the making of a golden plank of watermelon sugar. He was telling Al to be careful with his end. I saw Margaret climbing an apple tree beside her shack. She was crying and had a scarf knotted around her neck. She took the loose end of the scarf and tied it to a branch covered with young apples. She stepped off the branch and then she was standing by herself on the air. I stopped looking into the statue of mirrors. I'd seen enough for that day. I sat down on a couch by the river and stared into the water of the deep pool that's there. Margaret was dead. There was a swirl of water on the surface that cleared the pool all the way down to the bottom, and I saw the grand old trout staring back at me with a little eye-death bell hanging from his jaw. He must have swum upstream from where they were putting the tomb in. That's a long way for an old trout. He must have left just after I did. The grand, the grand old trout did not take his eyes off me. He remained stationary in the water, staring intently at me, as he had been doing earlier in the day when he lay by the tomb they were putting in. 
there was another swirl of water on the surface of the pool, and then I could not see the grand old trout anymore. When the pool cleared again, the grand old trout was gone. I stared at the place where he had been in the river. It was empty now, like a room. I went down to the watermelon works to see Fred. He was rather surprised to see me down there for the second time that day. Hi, right, what's up? It's Margaret. Have you seen her? Yes. What happened? She's dead. I saw her in the statue of mirrors. She hanged herself in an apple tree with her blue scarf. When did this happen? Just a little while ago. Nobody knows she's dead yet. Why did she kill herself, huh? Why would she do a thing like that? She's so young, so young. I don't know. I don't know why she killed herself. It's terrible. I wish I didn't have to think about it. You haven't the slightest idea, huh? You, you, you haven't seen her? No. I was looking in the statue of mirrors and I saw her there. She hanged herself there. She's dead now. I don't like this. Margaret's body was hanging from the apple tree in front of her shack and blowing in the wind. Her neck was at a wrong angle and her face was the color of what we learned to know as death. Fred cut the scarf with his jackknife while I lowered her body gently down. Let's take her to Ida. That's where she belongs. dressed in death robes made from watermelon sugar and adorned with beads of fox fire so the light would shine forever from her tomb at night and on the black soundless days this one we saw the light shining up from margaret the light that came from the fox fire upon her robes we took flowers and threw them upstream above her tomb. The flowers drifted down over the light coming from her. Roses and daffodils and poppies and bluebells floated on by. It's a custom here to hold a dance in the trout hatchery after a funeral. Everybody comes and much dancing goes on and everyone has a good time. After the funeral, we went back to Ida and prepared for the dance. Party decorations were put up in the hatchery and refreshments were prepared for the day. <coughs> Everybody got ready in silence. <coughs> we couldn't do anything until there was sound. We couldn't start the party until there was sound so the musical instruments would work. And so we could work with them in our own style, mostly waltzing. Everybody seemed to be in fairly good spirits. The musicians took out their instruments and waited for the black sun to go down. It would only be a few seconds now and we all waited patiently. The room glowed with lanterns. The trout swam back and forth in their trays and ponds. We would dance around them. Pauline looked very pretty. 
Charlie's new overalls looked good. I don't know why Fred's hair looked as if he hadn't combed it at all. <laughs> the musicians were poised with their instruments. They were ready to go. It would only be a few seconds now. I wrote. <laughs>